good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are, um, and welcome to the webinar. Um, basically, I want to just share some thoughts which are triggered by what's happening through the crisis, but also some uh, ideas about online learning, and particularly to use this as an opportunity to share some resources that hopefully you might find useful. So, um, I tried to structure my title in terms of three R's, revolution, reflections, and resources. The revolution part, well, it's a pretty tough time at the moment. I don't think anybody's in any doubt the uh, uh, crisis that we're in. And of course, one of the things that's doing is changing our approach to teaching. Uh, I can't think of anywhere I know where universities and other places are functioning as normal. We're almost all having to think very much about going online. And certainly for many of my colleagues, this is a, a very urgent challenge. We've somehow got to remake our material very quickly. Um, the Chinese have a, a, an interesting uh, character for a crisis. It's made up of two things. Um, it's threat and opportunity. And the or original word in Greek actually means turning point. So what I'd like to try and do is bring a, a slightly more forward thinking view to this situation and say not just how do we move our teaching into online mode now, but how might we look to the future and how might we think about blending different approaches, online and offline, but importantly, how are we going to make this transition? So that's the sort of the spur for the webinar. Um, just some brief personal reflections. I promise not to make this a, a, an autobiography, but I've been doing this quite a long time. Uh, thinking back, I've been moving from... 40 years where I've learned quite a lot about what I call broadcasting, so essentially traditional modes of teaching and lecturing and coaching, a variety of audiences, through to where I am today, which is much more concerned with enabling learning. And as some of you know, and was the subject of an earlier webinar, which you can still find on YouTube on the ISPIM channel, um, I've been very interested in the flipped classroom and the whole idea or the set of ideas behind that. But I think we've also got what I would call a context of concern. Even before this crisis, this virus crisis, which has changed so much, we were worrying about the whole teaching and learning side. On the one hand, my colleague Joe Tidd and I run many workshops on teaching and learning using our textbooks. And the feedback we've had from lecturers is very much the challenge is class sizes are growing. They're much more international now. It's much more difficult to get the sort of close interaction that in the past we might have relied on. Uh, we have uh, in the UK a measurement of universities teaching, the teaching excellence framework, and not everybody does very well on it. We may be good at research, but we're kind of not quite making the grade as far as what we could be doing with teaching. And so for a variety of reasons, there is certainly for me a context of concern, a set of challenges which I don't think are going to simply be solved by flipping the model. For those who don't know, the flipped classroom basically says, instead of talking to students, giving the lecture first, and then asking them to reflect on it and perhaps do some work, we flip that over, get them to look at a lot of resources before they come into classes, and then explore the issues and questions in the classroom. So it, it's turning the approach on its head. That's very powerful and the subject of other discussions, but I don't think we need just that. I think we need to build or possibly rebuild a new way of working. Uh, and so maybe the current crisis might act as a catalyst for that. Now, for me, there are three core approaches in my own thinking, which I'd like to share. The first is that I've been influenced for a very long time by David Kolb's learning cycle. I still think it's an extremely relevant device, which helps me think through, am I visiting all the stations that might support people's learning? Am I connecting them with real experience or drawing on their own? Am I giving them a structure with which to reflect and some challenges? Am I helping them access concepts and add to those uh, uh, theories their own ideas? And am I giving them a chance to experiment? So I'm very conscious still of the David Kolb model working. I think, however, what we're beginning to do and where there's a real opportunity is rediscover what I call the, the Oxford model. Uh, a long, long time ago, when universities were just beginning to happen, sort of hundreds of years back, you went to universities like Oxford to read for a degree. 
And that really is something we've lost sight of. What you do then was to spend a lot of time in the library, perhaps occasion, occasionally attending a public lecture, but the real learning happened with your own reading and reflection, and then your discussion once a week with your tutor. Small groups in a nice study with perhaps a cup of tea, but essentially shared small group exploration around personal learning. And I think we're perhaps moving in this model towards rediscovering that. At the same time, we're in an, a world which is characterized by what I call YouTube learning. Uh, essentially, the YouTube style is essentially one of high frequency, small packages, lots of short injections. And it strikes me that that kind of model for learning isn't that dissimilar from the agile innovation approach we teach so much about short, fast sprints that we go round and round cycles moving through our innovation process. So maybe the YouTube approach is a different way of structuring, a different way of cutting the, uh, the way we might teach and learn. For me, emerging from my own thinking and from particularly some of our attempts at moving online, a number of principles. My big journey has been from what I call the 45 minute broadcast plus fireworks model uh, and what I mean there is I'm reasonably now happy to stand up in front of any group of people and walk around the stage, wave my arms, do a few things they weren't expecting, the fireworks, but generally entertain them and challenge them with a 45 minute broadcast. But I'm realizing now that I'm moving towards five minute, very small packages, essentially delivered via YouTube, plus a lot of emphasis on reflection, inviting them and structuring uh, students to reflect, and then a little bit of what I call soft fireworks, things that might help to think about that learning and do it in a slightly different fashion. Uh, for me, the centerpiece now is no longer the broadcast, the lecture, it's the guided reflection. So it's allowing the student to do a great deal of learning themselves and structuring that learning, for me and my colleagues to provide tutorial support, that Oxford model, and perhaps the central device is no longer the textbook, the kind of broadcast book, but the student's own learning journal where they work through those ideas. So for me, this has been quite a, a fundamental shift and one that I'm finding quite interesting to work with. And perhaps our journey then, our job then as teachers and coaches is curating it's a little bit like having a huge art gallery or museum where there's a rich collection of resources and our job is to put on display the ones that are most likely to be helpful for the learner. And all of this, of course, requires us to think about the student integrating the knowledge that we're trying to build around something major, some sort of device that holds it all together. And my suggestion, my experience has been using a major project as an integrating device, which is driven by the student. So how would I design using the learning cycle? Well, in terms of the experience, what used to be stuff I might deliver in the classroom, it's now a matter of delivering small packages frequently. I guess for many of you, like we are here, we're in lockdown. And so pretty much all our stuff, all our contact from the outside world comes from people like Amazon delivering small packages once or twice a day. And that's not a bad metaphor for the, the kind of YouTube approach. Small learning packages delivered frequently. As I've already suggested, the reflection side, the guided and supported reflection becomes critical. And not simply saying, think about this, but actually giving a structure and giving a number of prompts to help students do that structured reflection. Linking that to concepts and helping them put the theories together and build a knowledge base and providing opportunities to play around with those ideas. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do and the main theme for today is to introduce you to what I call the resource supermarket. We talked about this in Florence at the ISPIM conference last year and it seemed to ring quite a lot of bells, but it's just a metaphor. It's actually something which goes back a long way. Uh, Joe Tidd and I have been writing about innovation management and writing textbooks for a long time. And for quite a lot of that time, there's been something which some of you may know, the Innovation Portal, which is a collection of support resources, case studies, some video, some audio, a lot of tools, a lot of activities, all sorts of stuff. 
And in the past, we put more and more on there. I think in the past, uh, over time, that's become a bit of a jungle. And so what we've been trying to do is to reinvent that in a more usable fashion. Uh, but what we're also trying to do and have been with this approach and something we certainly want to take further forward is make this an open source community of practice to learn our lessons from the open source world and say, what can we as teachers and coaches share with each other? So a lot of the values in those open source communities are about free sharing, free revealing. Here you are, have a look, use this. But also the idea that we'll give, but we need to give in order to be able to take. So it's a very cooperating, co-creating community. And what I'd like to do is briefly give you an overview today of what's in this supermarket where we can go shopping for resources to help us with our online work. But if it's of interest to offer future webinars, which perhaps focus on one or two specific supermarket aisles, maybe looking at key case studies or looking at the way we can use video or games. So very important. I'm not sure, but I hope this is going to work. I tested it with Lucia earlier. Where can you find the store? Well, at the moment, it's on my own website, which you can find at this address. And if this technology works, what I'm now going to try and do is just show you very, very briefly what's there and then invite you in your own time to play. It's all completely open. It's all completely free. So please help yourselves. Um, but if you click on that link, um, you eventually come to the website and there are various things going on. Um, in particular, you'll find the innovation portal on this top menu. You'll find another tab which says resources and you can scroll down through there. Um, this one, I'll draw your attention to the craft of innovation. This is the course I now teach. This is the course I'm teaching to a variety of students, um, six different courses at my own University of Exeter, plus some universities in Germany and in Norway who are also using these resources. And the craft of innovation, if I click on that, gives you some idea of the approach. Um, essentially, it's a modular course delivered either in short intensive weeks or over a, a period of time. But these are the modules, don't worry about the detail too much, but the typical things. What is innovation? Uh, how do we explore the opportunities? How do we search, select, all the usual things. But if I open any one of these boxes, the important thing is that what we've tried to do is make available a variety of different resources. These are the packages that we might assemble to deliver a course. So there's videos, there's readings, podcasts, various things. I invite you, rather than me trying to show in a clumsy fashion on the screen, please help yourself, please take a look. But that's where you'll find it, and I shall close that for now, but be very happy to take questions later on. But if I get out of all of that, yes. So hopefully we're now back to the, the PowerPoint screen. Because what I want to suggest now is very briefly, I might walk you through the store. Metaphor again, going shopping. So let's really stretch the metaphor. Imagine we're trying to prepare a meal with our students as the diners. And so the, um, what I call their learning journal, their workbook becomes the plate. This is their way of using and consuming the material and hugely important, uh, that's how they're going to capture their own personal learning from it. But what are we going to serve up with the meal? And more importantly, as we walk around the supermarket, what will we put in our trolley? Well, first of all, and again, taking our cue from YouTube, a lot of small packages of video and audio material. And again, if you were to look at the website, we've got close to 100 short films. Please look around them, help yourselves. Be as critical as you want. They're by no means perfect but we've been trying to learn the lesson of how to package, how to slice our textbook up, make it available in video and audio format in small packages. There are core readings, and this idea that I've mentioned earlier of reading for a degree is still very important. Students do need to read, but reading books is perhaps not so easy, not so fashionable. So what we've tried to do in our approach, in the online approach, is to say, what's the key knowledge? So typically it might be a chapter out of our textbook or a couple of key papers, some key focused chunks of knowledge, not the whole book. Additionally, 
obviously we teach with cases and for me cases are stories with a message and we can do a lot in terms not only of presenting that message in short packages format but also making it available with reflection questions helping the process of the student engage with the case to draw out the learning um, a lot of the things in the supermarket i'm trying to suggest i'm clumsy again um, come with vat attached that is to say trying to think of the video format the podcast the audio format as well as the text format certainly in the past we've done a lot with text-based cases I think more and more the students are finding them useful when they come as video audio as well. One of the key things, and this is where my idea of soft fireworks comes in, is ways in which we can get students to engage and to play around with the ideas that they picked up from their video, from their reading, from their cases. Um, now, in the flipped classroom world, this was going to be a big challenge because if students do a lot of the reading and the preparation before they come to a classroom, what do you do with an hour or two hours of lecture time? Well, there's all sorts you can do in terms of activities. You can play games, you can do exercises, you can get them involved in mini research projects, all sorts of physical things you can do in a real world. In the online world, we have to think differently, but we can bring the same approach. Individual reflections, individual activities, group activities where they might act as a small online community, dealing with small and possibly even large classes. And again, trying to think in terms of formats, video format to explain and encourage these activities, audio format, as well as texts and pictures. Um, all of these, are, uh, these headings, um, you can find examples of if you go into the, the website and explore that mini supermarket. Um, in addition to the activities, one of the other key things is not simply making innovation and entrepreneurship a theoretical construct, but actually involving developing of skills, building capabilities, making the concepts usable. Uh, and there are a variety of tools around. I'm sure many of you use things like the business model canvas, a wonderfully powerful and very simple tool which quickly communicates and students can use it to come up with and explore entrepreneurial ideas. It can be something as simple as a, a fishbone. It can be a competitor analysis. There are literally hundreds of tools available, uh, some proprietary, most of them in the public domain. And the other valuable thing about tools is one of the resources we can use is of course that uh, we can link them, say practice using this tool on this example, and there we have an activity. So the tools and activities can interchange. Um, another thing we're using are wider perspectives, other viewpoints from other people. In a real world setting, we might bring in guest lecturers of various kinds. We can do something similar. If you think about TED Talks, for example, there's some wonderful stuff, some very charismatic people, but they're essentially, again, short 15 minute focus packages. So there's a great deal of resource we can draw on. Many people now offer blogs, many people do interviews, all sorts of other things. But providing signposts and connections to that can widen anything that we might as individual lecturers be able to deliver online. Something else we've worked with for some time, the idea of what we call deeper dives, where we might dive deeply in, not to the whole subject, but a focused exploration of a key concept. As an example, if I were teaching, which I will be doing online tomorrow, about open innovation, well, there's a lot in that box, obviously, but one of the key questions has to do with absorptive capacity. And that's a good subject to drill down and explore in a much more focused fashion. So deeper dives. The role of the library. In Oxford, the way the model used to work is that there's this huge, well-resourced library where students would find the books and their tutor would guide them towards which books might be helpful. So we can do something similarly. We can signpost people to key articles, to key books, various video, audio, or text materials, and of course we can here make the connections to the research base. But our role is as curators and guides, people signposting them to what is in the online space easily and widely available and a rich set of resources. 
One of the other things that we do need to think about as teachers is assessment. And what we've been trying to do is develop simple assessments. Ours is a modular course, so we try and think of module by module ways of assessing, which might simply be asking the students to make a short presentation, which they can email back to us, or make a short video film or something else. But also, the point I made earlier, having an integrative major project, which draws many of the themes together. So we might, if it was a course on entrepreneurship, get them to produce a detailed, well thought through business case, which they would use all the elements of the business model canvas and various other tools to construct. If we're doing, which we do with our managing innovation course, trying to assess how well organizations might manage innovation, we have something called the innovation fitness test, which is a fairly detailed framework that students can use to draw all the themes together and apply to looking at a real case. But there are many other project-based learning opportunities. And if you think about many supermarkets today, just before you check out, there's a lot of novelty stuff, usually designed to catch the kids' attention, but stuff that you might pick up as a last thing, and little treats and so on. We've tried to produce some novelties. As some of you know, I'm in the habit of writing songs and even little sketches, fun and games, but they had a different perspective. So we've tried to do that. So uh, in terms of our meal, they might provide a little bit of seasoning. And in the back room, perhaps may I take you to the last place, behind the scenes in our current version of the supermarket, as I mentioned earlier, we're beginning to think it's really important to have not the textbook, but the student's learning journal, the student's workbook available as the core device. And so instead of issuing them with a textbook, we might, and this is where we're at the moment, have on the one hand of a page, or one side of the book, the text, the material that might be in a textbook, whether that's text, video, audio, or whatever, but on the other page, the space for students to reflect, so plenty of space for them to make their own notes, and the reflection prompts, the cases to look at and questions to ask, the activities they might go on, the tools they might play with. But this notion of two sides of a page, if I stay with that book metaphor, one is inf information, but the other, the key part, is the student's own learning journal. And they're putting together their very individual pathway through all of these uh, rich resources. So what's next? Well, most important, the store's open. Please help yourselves. To remind you, and I'll leave this again, that's the address. Uh, you don't need a password. And as far as I know, please tell me if there's any problems, um, it's all completely free and available. Um, I'd be very grateful for feedback to help us make this better, but it's all available now. And if you'd like to look particularly at the craft of innovation, you can see how we've been trying to build a course. If there are elements you can use, please help yourselves. Um, like I mentioned, what we're trying to do with the ISPIM Teaching and Coaching Special Interest Group is build a live community of practice which has this open source approach. Lots of sharing, constructive, helpful feedback, and co-creation. So please, if you have things you'd like to add, and I know some colleagues have already emailed me about this, please do so, and I'll try and post that into the, uh, uh, the website, uh, signposting to your particular contributions. Just a thought, this, hopefully, this post-virus world will pass, or the virus will pass, and we'll be in a post-virus world, and our world of university and teaching and coaching in business may not stay online. But that doesn't really matter, because I suggest that if we have a resource bank which is useful now when we are having to work online, it could also help us design and deliver right across the spectrum from the fully online world through all sorts of blends to full traditional face-to-face -face teaching. What's next for us? Well, we'd be very happy to offer some more focused webinars looking at those particular aisles in more detail. So if we took the case studies aisle, let's look at good case studies, look at what's available, look at how we might work with that. We did in fact do a, a webinar a little while ago on games, and there is a big project that JISPIM is part of looking at gamification. So again, there's a chance for a more focused webinar sharing ideas and resources in that space. But what else would help? This is very much coming from somebody, my personal reflections. I'm a newcomer in this game. I might have 40 years of teaching experience, 
but in terms of this online world it's a very very much shorter period of time so i'm interested in any thoughts and any ideas what else would help us as a community move forward and that's the point where i'm going to stop talking and hopefully we can move into more discussion so lucia back to you as moderator and i'll happily take any questions but i'll also be delighted if we can get a conversation going thank you very much um, John, thank you very much for this webinar. I think that's exactly what we need in this moment. Maybe just one question. Are you doing currently online lectures and what's the biggest obstacle that you face? <laughs> okay, uh, the answer to the first part is easy, yes. Um, the obstacle, um, it's more of a learning curve. Uh, at, at a technical level, mostly we're using Zoom uh, and that's one of the many and it's, it's working, but I think we're learning lessons about how to handle it. Uh, the gallery view is great when you can have a number of participants on your screen. Uh, and if I go back to my Oxford tutorial model, if I have 10, maximum 15 people, I can see them all and we can almost have a conversation. That kind of tutorial works well and I'm finding that useful. Challenge is how you move to bigger classes. Um, we're playing with, um, having cohorts so we run the session three or four times for a larger class but again having a small group in any one of those sessions um, so that's a challenge um, I think the other thing for me I still find it um, and I think the students find it too slightly odd to flip straight away from broadcast where the students sit and listen and I talk to the kind of flipped model where they've spent the time watching the small packages, listening to the podcasts, reading the core readings, and then they're coming in with um, questions. So I wouldn't say we're getting there, or we're there yet, but we're gradually changing the approach and all of us, students and teachers, learning to do this differently. But there, there's a ways to go yet. Thank you. What's the biggest number of part the participants that you usually have um, in the class? Uh, well, what we've been trying to do is break it down at the moment. Um, the idea is that the, uh, the, 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 the uh, online materials, we can spread to everyone. So, for example, um, we have a, a master's program with 200 students or 188 students. Um, clearly, there's no way we could get them all together anymore. And they're, in fact, globally distributed. So even in time zones, it would be very, very difficult to get them all together but they can look at the videos, do the core reading, do some reflection exercises, that they can all do in their own time. So there is no upper limit of numbers there. The tutorial approach that I mentioned, we're playing, and it is still our learning curve, we're playing with uh, 15 as the maximum. And I would, if I'm honest, I'd prefer 10. I can see 10 people in one screen and I can get some sense of um, conversation going on in that group. But that's, we're still very early into this. We only, uh, seems like a lifetime, but it's only been a month since Exeter has officially been uh, online only. Yeah, thank you very much. So I asked our participants about future webinars, but maybe you can also answer here this question like briefly. Yeah. Um, so Rafael is interested in learning how to do real interactive case studies in online lectures. Can you give like a quick advice or? Okay, yes. Um, well, case studies are, as I said earlier, for me, are stories with messages. So they're very much stories. Um, the danger, and I'm guilty of this as well, is often case studies are quite long. And um, again, this kind of YouTube discipline of slicing the thing thin, not necessarily losing it, but breaking it into smaller bites. Um, so my suggestion is to make the case fairly short. Um, there's a number that we can revisit the case, but if we take the case in a fairly short fashion, um, that could be made into a video and that gives you some background. Um, there's often an activity which I'm trying to use, which asks the students to do a bit of research on the background to the particular company or the particular thing that the case is going to illustrate. Um, certainly creating a number of reflection questions back to the students learning journal the workbook having maybe five or six questions look at the case read it explore it do some research and then answer these questions 
if you can or if I can do that and get the students to do that kind of work beforehand when they come in the tutorial we can it's not a million miles away from the Harvard model in fact we can then have a really rich conversation about the case and I can bring in extra information extra guidance or deal with specific questions but certainly for me the uh, the short-term challenge is to slice the cases mu into much smaller packages. Um, I have um, a, a number of those. I'm trying to get to short cases, but I also have a very big one, um, a German company I wrote a book about. So if I did that case, it would take forever. But actually what I'm trying to do is slice the thing into small pieces which focus on one particular question in each of the, uh, the packages. And that's proving quite useful, and it's an integrative big case. Um, but that's my approach to cases. But I come back to my point. This is a community where I would really like to learn from other people. How are they, how are whoever asked the question, how are you using cases um, in this interactive mode? Um, so yeah, that's, that's my short comment. Um, but as I say, for me, my personal challenge is to slice the cases thinner but also, if possible, make them come alive through uh, video and audio material as well. Uh, thank you, John. Another interesting question that we have, it's um, comparison of interaction. So how much interaction do you find in online teaching compared to flipped classroom face-to-face? -face? <laughs> Another great question. Well, um, it, it, it's interesting. I, I, paradoxically, um, in the online teaching, and we're still going up our learning curve, because we're trying to structure what the students do in terms of a great deal of self-reflection. So I come back, the learning journal that they have, the workbook that we, we give them, is full of reflection questions uh, and activities and tools and things. So in a sense, to say, please prepare to share five minutes from your side, in a sense, we're giving an instruction, they then feel in class, but these are small classes, as I say, maybe a session of 10 or 15 students, um, but they're, they're invited to prepare. So in a sense, I'm using a flipped approach, getting them to do something before they come to the live online uh, web seminar, web tutorial, um, that works, or is working better. Um, if I go back to our experience in the live world of flipped classroom, this was one of the problems we started to have, that by flipping the classroom, we created lots of space. We didn't need to deliver lectures in the classroom, but it's quite a culture change, especially for students who come from cultures who are less about self-presentation or about appearing in public. Designing activities uh, for that space has been quite a challenge. Um, something that has worked quite well is mini research projects, where students having got hold of an idea a theme, let's take a value proposition. So they will have looked online, they will have explored and read and watched videos about a value proposition. Now here's your activity, and this is in a live situation, uh, go out and test your value proposition on, uh, on campus or wherever the situation is and come back. So in a sense, we've constructed a mini research project. Uh, what I would do in the online world is probably get them to go online, go out into the internet and do some mini research and bring back and present their findings in one of these web tutorials. Thank you, John. That was a great answer. Um, question from Luciana. So she's facing problems where she cannot motivate students to go online. Are you, <laughs> are you facing the same problems? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, I mentioned in the back room we have uh, our laboratory. We're still trying to find this magic ingredient that will make students motivated. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer. Um, I think that's as much an online as it is an offline world question. How do I get my students to turn up on a Friday morning at nine o'clock for a lecture? It's difficult. Um, and, and I think the challenge is... Um, is theirs rather than ours. Why are they investing their time and their money in taking university courses if they don't want to learn? So in a sense, there is that kind of hard question at the back. Um, there might be ways into it. Um, for me, the novelties help. 
you know, making a bit of fun, that's something I'm trying to do. Um, I wish I had an easy answer. I think if you go back to Kolb's learning cycle, the one thing Kolb doesn't deal with is how you motivate people to enter the cycle in the first place. So yeah, we don't really know how many students we're going to get. Um, it's much more difficult to, to manage, to, uh, to keep track of, to, I was going to say police, that's probably the wrong word, but it's much more difficult in the online world. Um, there are probably little things we can do in terms of scheduling and we're trying to work with that. Um, I think it's probably about making the content much less traditional. Um, I think as our students begin to understand, we've tried to structure this, our course at least, in this very different YouTube world, small packages, self-learning, they're beginning to get that. So they aren't being asked to sit down and listen for 40 minutes while I sit at my desk here and broadcast. So maybe that's helping, but I don't have an easy answer to the question. It's a really important one and any thoughts you have, I'd love to hear. Uh, thank you for that. What about uh, when it comes to rating and assessment? Um, you already mentioned this like briefly, but um, how do you prevent so some students don't do free riding and so on? Again, that's a difficult one. And it's not just an online world question. Uh, we get a lot of free riding. We have a lot of group projects as our, in our traditional world of approach. And we always have the complaints of free riders. So I think that happens. Um, I... I think it also, uh, particularly as we structure many more of the assignments around go online, find this, do some research, we run a risk of plagiarism, we run a risk of students not doing their own work. For me, this is why the centerpiece perhaps is this student learning journal. Um, it, it, it's almost like producing a portfolio. Uh, years and years ago, I remember I, I had a, long before I got married, I had a girlfriend who was an art student and I realized Art students build their own portfolio and they carry this around and that's their learning. That's how you know how well they've developed in terms of their training as an artist because of the pictures and sketches and designs in their portfolio. And in a sense, this idea of the student learning journal as their capturing the learning. Now, if they want to cheat on that and borrow something from Picasso instead of doing it themselves, I'm not sure how we can control it. Um, so I'm not sure that, that, that moving online changes much in terms of the way we can do it. It probably just brings the problem into a new, new domain. Um, yeah, so I'm not, I didn't come on to this webinar with lots of answers, more suggesting some resources, but certainly anyone with answers or as a community that we could share around how to motivate and how to to build that sense of responsibility for personal learning, that would be really helpful information. Yeah, that's always ongoing debate, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Chris has a bit different question. Mm -hmm. He's asking about tips for you to offer for preparing one of online sessions, but his students are not in a formal ongoing course. So he's teaching uh, and coaching, he's talking about teaching and coaching innovation across a large public sector organization. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a really interesting question. Um, one of the things that prompted me and my colleagues to create some of the resources, and indeed that thing I showed, the craft of innovation, which is our course, um, is an approach which is not dissimilar to the kind of market or the kind of con uh, students that uh, he, he's talking about. Um, we have in the UK um, a, 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 what's called an apprenticeship program, which allows individuals in organizations to learn largely in the context of those organizations, largely in isolation from each other. So it's an individual thing. And the deal is basically the government has a tax on the companies the companies have to pay into a levy, but they can take the money out if they spend it on training. So the deal is that the companies think, well, I can train my staff. And the contract with the individuals is, if you put in the time, some of your own energy and time, as well as the company time, we will pay for you to take this course. So we've had to create materials which are essentially available to people who are learning 
in their own time or in the company's time, but alongside their day-to-day -day job, um, and which build up over time towards something. Now, this, if they wanted to, and the program we develop, does eventually lead to an MBA or part of an MBA, but it's also possible just to do that learning as continuing education, continuing professional development. In a sense, the modules, the materials, what we've been trying to do is to design so that we have that flexibility. From a personal point of view, I think, never mind the post-virus world, I think we're moving anyway into a world where there's going to be a massive expansion of learning from individuals who are not at universities and not registered in formal courses. I think the potential for opening up this online or blended learning world is huge. Um, and I'd look at myself. I mean, I'm learning four or five different things um, through YouTube, various different courses. I'm trying desperately to learn Russian. I'm trying to learn a new musical instrument. I'm trying to learn to draw. None of those are going to give me a qualification. All of them are my personal learning journey through these kinds of open resources. So I guess we've been trying to work in that space uh, and we like to think, but again, feedback would be very helpful, um, that these resources uh, are, are useful in the kind of context he describes. I guess the other comment there is the smaller the packages, the more chance it is for people in those kind of contexts to, um, to access them. They may not have the time to uh, sit in a lecture in the 45 minute traditional thing, but they may well, whilst they're cooking dinner, be able to hear a podcast or as they're driving, they might listen to something or they might be able to snatch 10 minutes to look at and make a few notes on a video. So there are a few thoughts in that direction.